for people thinking about society, doing research in the social sciences and acting politically in the world, it makes a big difference to find an author, a body of work, a set of ideas that break open the bait and that uh, suggests ways in which our questions and our observations link to larger conversations. And for many of us working in agrarian political economy, the work and life of Bridget O'Loughlin has provided um, this gateway. Bridget started as an anthropologist in Stanford in the 1970s, teaching and participating in reading groups that introduced uh, many to Marxist political economy. Uh, but in 1979, Bridget moved to Mozambique, which was at the time a newly independent uh, republic, socialist uh, republic. Um, and so Bridget lived in Mozambique um, through this period of a huge elation and expectation about um, the socialist project, but also through its unraveling as a result of external aggression and then civil war. In Mozambique, Bridget uh, uh, worked as a lecturer and researcher in the Center of African Studies in Maputo, uh, working under the direction of uh, Ruth First and Aquino de Braganza and conducting a unique and unprecedented exercise of group field research in a number of uh, districts of Mozambique. Um, the assassination of Ruth First, killed by a parcel um, bomb that was sent by the, by the South African apartheid regime to first um, his office with Bridget and others present uh, when it exploded, marked a very dramatic turn in Bridget's life, but also in the fortunes of the ANC in exile in Mozambique at the time, and the story of the young Mozambican Republic. By the early 1990s, Bridget moved um, to uh, the Netherlands um, to work as a lecturer in population and development in the ISS, uh, where she uh, worked until uh, retirement in 2008. Uh, for a decade, um, she was one of the editors of Development and Change, and we are now delighted to have um, enticed her to uh, come across the channel and join um, the Journal of Agrarian Change. Um, throughout a life spanning three continents and all these crucial historical processes, Brigitte has made some very central contributions to a range of disciplines and debates. In this past decade, uh, Brigitte has been as incisive uh, but even more prolific than ever. Um, in this age of uh, disciplinary sedentarism, Brigid was a daring trespasser and remains both a disruptor of theoretical boundaries as well as a meticulous uh, fieldwork researcher. Um, she's a very generous trespasser as well. Um, she's been an enthusiastic interlocutor of hundreds of um, students and researchers, especially in Mozambique, where she remains very active. Bridget epitomizes what it is to be a radical intellectual, uh, both in thinking and acting uh, against the grain, and sometimes paying a very hefty price for doing so, but also in terms of being analytically and politically firmly rooted to the ground. It is therefore a great pleasure uh, to welcome you, Bridget, um, to this conversation. Hi, Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Elena. Your work in political economy has gone farther than most in proposing ways of understanding uh, what you call um, these um, contingent outcomes of these long-term structural relations and the political uh, struggles of resistance in Southern Africa. Um, however, it appears um, that most work in critical political economy truly struggles to connect relations of production on the one hand and the study of political agencies, um, resistance and collective struggles. Um, Bridget, do you agree with this characterization? And if so, how can we overcome this impasse? I think I don't completely agree with the um, terms, because I, I think also that our difficulties reflect the difficulties of socialist movements, um, that we are, as Marxist intellectuals, which I, the category in which I'd put myself, we're, we're always working with the idea that we should be organic intellectuals in some ways, that we should be able to learn from movements and participate in some way with them. And we've always fallen short 
the whole idea of an organic <laughs> intellectual. Well, Gramsci did it, but you know, imagine the person who had the kind of self-discipline to keep working in prison <laughs> doing all that reading and thinking. I mean, you know, it's a very ambitious thing. So the advantage of working, of being rooted in movements, is that the movement itself carries you on with its questions and keeps you working within it. And those things, you know, uh, you're dependent to some extent on what there is in the world. Mm -hmm. And the recently what's dominated the literature on resistance, I would say, is much more Scott's work and what's followed from it. Things which are important, forms of casual resistance. Mm -hmm. But from exactly the point that you raised in the beginning, Developing collective forms of resistance is what <laughs> shapes history. Yeah? And that seems to me important. Um, you mentioned that I like the word contingency, which is true. And that you know, it's true that that's not a very popular. <laughs> in my attempts to launch that in the world, that, you know, that hasn't been that successful. I think, though, that. I would like to say, no, I, I think I really meant something very simple, not, uh, and, and contingency might not be the right word. But as with structure, it is also true that words like class, contradiction, dialectics have currently been dropped from our analytical maybe not from our thinking, but from our published analytical record. And that's really what I think I learned so much from reading Marx, not just from reading Capital, but particularly reading the 18th Brumaire, that what we want is to understand that the present is history. It's not that history is the context, it's that history is the present and the present is present in movement and that Things like class contradictions don't have <laughs> unique outcomes. They are the product of these ongoing struggles. They're shaped by their history, but they are also unpredictable. Marxism is not, in that sense, a, an absolutely predictive science, and it can be um, quite false to try to make it so. But what it should be is something which is distinctive in its focus on how particular conjunctures and structural possibilities lead to the development of collective movements, which can fail or can actually change things. And that's what I think is important for us. And what I have tried, I would say, not necessarily successfully to do. Um, but one of the things is, for example, pointing out that some of, some of the forms of petty resistance, um, like fleeing from your boss and whatever, involved going to another boss. That is, they weren't challenging the structure per se, and finding ways to link those forms of struggle in more collective ways should be something which we should try to inform. Absolutely, and there's um, this aspect that you uh, have discussed about the irreversibility of processes of commodification that I think it's um, so incisive when criticizing narratives of uh, unchanging traditional uh, communal structures. Yeah, no, that's true, and that's also been affected by work that I didn't do in Mozambique, by my own thesis research. Uh, which was on, um, well, in retrospect, it was not a Marxist topic, I would say. <clears throat> it was um, on collective work groups in Chad. And um, quite close to the beginning of my field work, there was a cotton market. Now, that meant that they, they didn't really generally have markets there. And the cotton buyers came and gave them fixed prices. And they brought cotton, which was no longer a forced crop. But the whole organization of it was still very much like it had been in the forced cropping period. Um, and 
as I was sort of sitting around, only partially understanding what people were saying, I heard them talking all the time about Mbaipuki, Mbaipuki, which meant white chief. Now that word was used for any white, so it was used for me too, and I became you know, a little paranoid, and it, it, it increased my you know, motivation to learn to speak well. But then I, when I asked about it, people said, no, no, they weren't talking about you. They were talking about the district administrator. And the problem was that people had been told to separate their own cotton into <laughs> poor quality and better quality. So, and it, the thing is that the poor quality was this co yellow cotton that you have to struggle to take out of the thing, which they were being forced to do. And then they were going to switch from a system in which everything was paid at the same price to this differentiation. And people were outraged. And they were outraged because it was not just about price, it was about what they considered just for their work. And I thought, you know, this is a problem that only Marxists really have talked about. So my, you know, my commitment to anthropology as field work, yes. But my commitment to Marxism was, look, if I have found things that are simplistic in Marxism vis-a-vis -vis, you know, what, what you see as an anthropologist, well, then work on it. I mean, you know, I have to do that. So it, was, it represented a whole change in my way of thinking about things, because that was a world which people would have said there were no regular markets, you know, no, or at least in that period, no migrant labor. Um, apparently a world that was disengaged from capital. And yet here we were, you know, it seemed to me, no, this is about the nature of capital. Of course, I should have reformulated my whole focus of research to do something much more pointed on cotton. Um, and I didn't, I kept on with my, <laughs> you know, what, what's happening with collective work groups, which should have been completely predictable given this level of commodification and strain, which was that, you know, it was going to be on its way out. Because as soon as the cotton company began to introduce the idea of specialized commodity producers with higher input use <laughs> and all of that, then people were no longer willing to use or to contribute collective labor to those specialized producers who were making more out of their cotton crops. So it was inevitable that, you know, I could talk about Polanyi and the formalist versus substantives forever, but really the underlying issue was the changing forms of commodification in that context. Mm -hmm.